So, so maybe Bill, you can give us that overview uh, on how breast cancer uh, is uh, distinguished molecularly, the subset of patients who are hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative, kind of the traditional care, uh, and then the advent of CDK46 and how it's changed uh, the current guidelines, both NCCN among others. Sure. So I think that uh, as a clinician, we still, despite all the tools that we have available today, and I'm referring to sophisticated tests, molecular testing, and we may come to that, we still fundamentally look at breast cancer and divide it up into just a couple of different buckets of breast cancer. And that is ER positive breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer, so-called triple negative breast cancer, where the markers are absent, or some combination of ER and HER2 being positive. And to a large degree, our treatment decisions are based on knowing which category that a patient falls into. And for those that have metastatic disease, unless there is some visceral crisis or the tempo of the disease is significantly rapid, if the patient has hormone-sensitive breast cancer, we typically prefer to use anti-hormone therapy. And the reason for that is because obviously the toxicity associated with it as a general statement is much, much better than chemotherapy. And in that subset of cancer, we find that chemotherapy isn't necessarily better. So that perception sometimes on patients' parts or even on the part of their clinicians that you must give chemotherapy because it's the more potent way of treating the cancer doesn't necessarily translate into a better outcome. So with that said, we've typically tried to use single agents, um, whether it's tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, fulvestrant. We use them in sequence until the patient has changed or the tempo of their disease has changed or they become refractory to endocrine therapy and then we go on to other treatments. More recently, we've started to see the introduction of partners to endocrine therapy. And uh, you know, before the CDK4-6 inhibitors, there was a, even an effort 20 or 30 or more years ago to combine endocrine therapy. That wasn't particularly fruitful. So we've, again, used se sequencing single agents. And then probably a decade ago, we started to understand some of the molecular pathways a little bit better. And the first drug that was introduced that we partnered with endocrine therapy was an mTOR inhibitor, Everlimus. And in combination with an aromatase inhibitor, that proved to be more effective than the aromatase inhibitor alone. But more recently, where all the excitement is focused, and obviously the subject of much of what we're talking about today, is the CD4-6 inhibitors and understanding how those work and then developing a drug, drugs, plural, that affected that pathway has proven to be very effective in the treatment of advanced breast cancer. And I know we'll probably get into some of the details perhaps about the individual trials. But with the introduction of CD4-6 inhibitors, that really overnight in a sense changed how we approach patients because now it's pretty much uh, standard to use a combination endocrine therapy with something else when we're treating patients with ER positive metastatic breast cancer. So Bill, you mentioned the visceral crisis as historically one of the reasons why chemotherapy might be used. Do we know if that paradigm has changed using a CDK4-6 in combination with an endocrine agent? Well, I think it probably still holds true. It's also worth saying that a visceral crisis sometimes is in the eye of the beholder. You know, sometimes a medical oncologist will see two liver lesions and think, well, that's, that's bad. We have to go to chemotherapy. But what I'm really referring to, and I think um, I'll let Joyce comment on this herself, but it's usually when you see bulky disease where you have probably one opportunity to really get things under control. Otherwise, the patient is going to decline rapidly. It's that circumstance where things are changing rapidly that we're more inclined to use chemotherapy. The presence of visceral disease alone does not dictate that you must give chemotherapy. You could use endocrine therapy in that setting. Joyce, so great segue to bring you in. And I actually do quite a bit of real world evidence research and I see huge variance in the use of chemotherapy um, in the HR positive metastatic breast population first line. And it, it's difficult to know. I mean, all these patients clearly have lung and liver meds, at least in their claims coding, but it's hard to believe that crisis patients could be as high as 
you know, I don't know what that number should be. Is it 5%? Is it 10? Um, and it, it seems like we need, um, it, it'd be great again, addressing Steve's prior comments, that it, these are the kind of areas where clinicians need to have a role, that I think that we've been too hesitant to let it be in the eye of the beholder, then provide some definition. Bilirubin greater than 1.5, transaminase is greater than two times normal. Something that might speak to the impact on an organ that would say adding this therapy and the cost and its toxicity and its risk of hospitalization, whatever, uh, would play a role. So I'm really curious to get your perspective. I wanted to set it up a bit. Yeah, it is puzzling um, to um, those of us who, uh, you know, do a lot of breast cancer, you know, and the data on the first line CDK4-6 inhibitors basically show that the median progression-free survival with an endocrine agent and CDK4-6 inhibitors, you know, being a bit over two years, sometimes approaching 30 months, is three to four times longer than you'd get with even combination chemotherapy. So, um, and the CDK4-6 inhibitors are beginning to have a positive impact on overall survival. So it's actually puzzling why somebody would use chemotherapy first line, unless as Bill exactly, I think, put it as I would agree, you, you know, you've got one shot, the organ dysfunction is so bad that you've got one shot to get that patient symptomatically, get that organ back functioning, or else she's not going to be well enough to get a second line of therapy. That's where we should be confining our chemotherapy to. Um, and so it is puzzling. I think it's part of it may be an educational process uh, with the thinking that the chemotherapy may work faster than, uh, particularly a combination chemo may work faster than the CDK4-6 inhibitors, although they, they work very, very quickly. And I, I think those data show that the tempo of them working in terms of the antiproliferative effect is, is, is as fast as chemotherapy. So I think there just needs to be kind of more educational um, digging as to find out, you know, where that 30 to 40% comes from, because it's, it's not all visceral crisis, that's for sure.